Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is very gratifying. Thanks so much for coming. I wanted to mention that at last we have entered into the current century and we now have a Facebook page as of yesterday. So if you are a, yeah. So if you're a Facebook user, just do a search for sound waves, all one word, and you will find us and you can like us and then you'll get any kind of information that we choose to put up. The schedule for the rest of the semester is posted there. There are links to the web pages of all of our scientists and musicians. And uh, I don't know what else I'll be putting up there, but hopefully some interesting stuff. Also, there's a place for you to submit suggestions if you have uh, ideas of themes that we might choose or any kind of other suggestions, well, I would love to read those. So that's at facebook.com. So tonight our topic is rhythm and we have a distinguished array of scientists speaking about rhythm as it affects us and we've st structured a kind of a funnel down from the rhythm at an astronomical scale all the way down to the rhythms of our individual bodies. And I think it's going to be really interesting. It, it appears that for some reason our world is organized in a way in which time periods are regular in many ways. I do not know why that should be the case. Frankly, I don't even know why there is time at all. Um, and given that there is, why there should be such a notion of periodicness to the time, um, which goes all the way from orbits of planets and presumably of galaxies, all the way down to the way that our bodies function. And we seem to have a need for, in our own lives, rhythm in different areas, Rhythm, the rhythms of our chores, our tasks, rhythms in our jobs. We like to listen to music that has a strong feeling of rhythm. And so let us now learn all about rhythm in its many manifestations and guises, starting with Ellen's Bible. Can everybody hear me? As Dan just said, the universe can seem like a chaotic place, and it is chaotic, but there are rhythms that, that we can count on. We can count on the length of a day, we can count on the length of a year, the phases of the moon. So there are many different kinds of rhythms in the universe, but in honor of the name of this series, I'm going to talk about a type of regular rhythm called sound waves. So uh, we know all about waves. Here on the left, I don't know how well you can see this. Um, this is a dragonfly. And the motions of this dragonfly have created this series of, of regular ripples here in a pond. And so that's a water wave. But what I'm speaking to you in now is a sound wave. And um, so uh, here, here I am. And I'm making little uh, regions of high pressure that are traveling from my vocal cords out through the air and um, impinging on your ear. And what I'd like you to take away from this is are these, these bands which indicate that sound waves are traveling high density regions. So this is going to come up again and again in my talk. And one of the one of the things that I love about astronomy is that although the universe is exotic and huge and hot and cold and old, there are some very familiar things about it. And one of the most familiar things to me is sound waves. So now let's step back and actually do some astronomy. So this is the Perseus cluster of galaxies. Uh, you can see it if you look at the constellation Perseus which is up in the fall. Don't go out and try to find it now, I don't think. Um, this is a cluster, one of the many galaxy clusters in our universe. It's about 250 million light years away. So we're seeing it as it was 250 million years ago. There are thousands of galaxies in this image. Basically, every little fuzzy dot that you see is an individual galaxy. And each one of those galaxies has about 100 billion stars. 
And the whole size of this is a few million light years. And if it were brighter than it is, so it's too faint to see with the naked eye, but if you could see it with the naked eye, it would be about as broad as two full moons. So galaxy clusters are the largest objects that we know in the universe. And amazingly to me, uh, this image was made by, by an amateur, a British amateur uh, named Paul with a high-end telescope. And as someone who lugged her little telescope all around the backyard as a kid looking for holes in the tree canopy, I think it's amazing what, am what amateurs can do these days. But one thing that amateurs cannot do is look at the sky in x-rays. So this is an x-ray view um, of the Perseus cluster. Uh, this was made with telescopes in space. The atmosphere absorbs x-rays. Uh, and this is a, so taken as a whole, the cluster looks kind of boring. It's just kind of a fuzzy ball uh, indicating that there's a lot of hot gas. So this is gas so hot that unlike something like a fire, which puts out energy, puts out light that we can see, this hot gas puts out x-rays. And if we zoom in on the very center, we see this kind of weird and spooky looking structure where the x-rays get brighter, but then there are these cavities, these two dark cavities here. So what's going on with these cavities? Well, these galaxies are centered on a very weird galaxy. Uh, the central galaxy of Perseus, it goes by the name NGC 1275, New General Catalog, number 1275. And this image was actually made um, by Wisconsin astronomers uh, at the Wynn Telescope. So this is a telescope that we manage about one quarter of. And you can see the, the galaxy, the stellar fuzzy spot here, and then these filaments of hot gas that kind of stream away from the galaxy like a series of arms or filaments. Now let's look at NGC 1275 in x-rays. And we see a close-up of these cavities. So here, the, here it's bright. Uh, here we see these dark cavities. This is the central part of the galaxy. So what's going on there? Well, at this point, telescopes fail us. And so what I'm showing you is an artist's conception of what we could see if we could see down to the very center of this galaxy. And what we would see is a, a disk of gas and dust that obscures a massive black hole, a black hole of about a billion solar masses. So why can't we see this? We can't see this because the size of a billion solar mass black hole is only about as big as the distance between the Earth and Saturn. So it's immeasurably tiny. We can't hope to resolve it. But we have some clues as to what's going on here. And notice in particular that there's matter kind of being flung out along the axis of rotation of this black hole. And it forms these jets. So now let's go back to x-ray images. So here's an image similar to what you saw. And here's an ingeniously processed image, an image designed to bring out the very faintest features. And what do we see? We see a pattern of bright and dark, very similar to that set of ripples that was going away from the dragonfly's motion in the pond. So we're we're seeing sound waves. And they're being emitted, we think, by the jets that are launched by this black hole. So how does this work? And what are we looking at here? So here's the wave picture again to remind you. Um, ripples of high and low density, just as we saw. Ripples here coming out from a source. So. Let's compare. Well, so the very lowest sound that a human being can hear um, has the distance between, um, or the, the time period of a cycle, kind of from here to here, is about 8 one hundredths of a second. The sound waves that we see in Perseus have crests that are about 20 million years apart. 
So this is a sound wave with a period of 20 million years and a length of about 60,000 light years, which is bigger than our entire galaxy. And yet, it's a regular pattern of waves. And these waves are important. These waves are a way of carrying energy that was originally the gravitational energy of the black hole. It's transferred to the surrounding gas. These jets that you saw in the artist's image um, blow these cavities, these bubbles. And the bubbles emit the waves, and the waves carry energy, and they heat the gas. So what have we learned from this amazing discovery? This is only a few years old. Several things. So we learned that, that black hole jets blow bubbles. And the reason they appear as cavities on an x-ray image is that there's no hot gas in those bubbles. There's just magnetic fields and particles, charged particles, traveling at about the speed of light, so-called relativistic particles. No x-rays, because magnetic fields and relativistic particles are there. And just like a pebble or a, tossed into a pond or a dragonfly moving its wings, these bubbles launch sound waves. And these sound waves help to explain why the gas is hot enough to emit x-rays, because some of the energy from the black hole goes into those sound waves and then gets dissipated. So this was a wonderful discovery. And it's really the same idea of the sound waves that I'm speaking to you in now. But those are not the longest sound waves that we know in the universe. So this is an image. What, is this, what does this show here? Um, so bear with me. This will take a minute to explain. This scale um, represents distance. And it's in a unit called megaparsec. So one megaparsec is about 3 million light years. And the scale goes up to uh, over 100 million light years. And this is a measure of how many galaxies? So we look at the whole sky. There are hundreds, thousands, millions of galaxies that we can see. And we count how many pairs of galaxies are a certain distance apart. And we see, well, there are a lot of galaxies close together. And then as we go to galaxies further apart, the number declines. But then there's this funny bump here that kind of interrupts this gradual decay. And this bump, what this bump is telling us is that there's kind of an excess of galaxy pairs 500 million light years apart. Why is that? That's because these galaxies formed out of gas that had been made dense because it was part of a sound wave. And the imprint of that sound wave, which now has a wavelength of 500 million light years, is with us in the galaxy distribution today. This could not have been done without the so-called Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, which has been going on for a couple of decades now. Um, this is Roman numeral three. We've just started Roman numeral four. Um, I'm happy to say that my department here has just joined. So we're going to become a part of this. We weren't before. And this is not the only way we can see the very longest sound waves. Here's an image that maybe some of you have seen. It's just a couple of years old. So the universe is pervaded by this so-called cosmic microwave background radiation, left over from the Big Bang when our universe started and was very hot. And for until a few years ago, this radiation was thought to be perfectly uniform and constant everywhere in space. But with very, very sensitive measurements, it was possible to detect tiny differences, about one part in 100,000 in the intensity of this radiation around the sky. And that's what you see here, color coded in yellow and blue. And it looks pretty chaotic, right? There are just all kinds of spots, and they seem to form little chains, and there are holes, and it's 
it's very chaotic and it's hard to remember, but you should remember that these are actually tiny, tiny differences, one part in 100,000. So due to the genius of an 18th century mathematician uh, named Joseph Fourier, it's possible to take this picture apart and see it as a collection of waves, a collection of perfectly periodic waves. So it's as if when you heard the jazz, as you will, in a few, or I guess about an hour, if you could sit and listen to the jazz, you could say, oh, well, that's an A, and it's being played with a C, and there's a B flat over here, and there's a D, and there's a G. As if your mind could constantly take the music apart into those notes. So that's what we can do with this image. And we find the same 500 million light year peak. These are called the baryon acoustic oscillations. And what have astronomers learned from the baryon acoustic oscillations? Well, we've learned that the universe not, is not slowing its, ex its, so the universe is expanding from the Big Bang. You've probably all heard that. Um, up until a few years ago, it was thought that the expansion was slowing down because gravity tends to kind of pull stuff back in. But we learned from the baryon acoustic oscillations and a couple of other completely independent ways of looking that the universe is actually going faster. There's something accelerating the expansion. There's something pushing it. And for lack of a better term, we call that dark energy. And we don't know what dark energy is. This has, this has thrown my ability to teach general astronomy into complete confusion. Because I used to tell a very nice story about the Big Bang. And now I have to come to this part where we don't know what's going on. So it really is a complete mystery to us. And, but it's very important. And it's so important that it was recognized in 2011 with a Nobel Prize in physics. So it's a discovery that's really revolutionized the way we think about the universe. So I've taken you through two of the greatest sound waves that I know in the universe. There were many others that I didn't think I had time to talk about. The sun is oscillating like an organ pipe. It has about 10 million sound waves running around in it. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, I hope you enjoy, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I hope you enjoy the other presentations and I hope you enjoy the music. I'm looking forward to all of them. So thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Keith Woodward. Um, I'm a human geographer uh, here um, on campus. And uh, I'm, I'd like to walk you through um, some of the rhythms of the city. But in order to, to start that off as a kind of prelude to it, I, I hope you'll indulge me and let me just show you a short video um, by, uh, it, which uh, comes from an interview with John Cage, who's uh, a composer. Um, of experimental music, he uses all sorts of different sounds uh, to get, you know, every that come from everyday life, like you know kettles boiling and so on and so forth, to help produce ideas of music for him. Um, and I, I would argue that in some ways uh, he's also an honorary geographer, um, so produce a, a, a character who produces uh, his own artist's renditions of, of space uh, at the level of the city. 
Um, and so I hope you'll indulge me and just uh, let me show you a couple of minutes of this, and then um, I'll walk you through some of the ways that uh, I see uh, what uh, uh, John Cage is talking about um, appearing in, in our in our everyday lives in urban spaces. When I hear what we call music, it seems to me that someone is talking and talking about his feelings are about his ideas of relationships. But when I hear uh, traffic, the sound of traffic here on 6th Avenue, for instance, I don't have the feeling that anyone is talking. I have the feeling that uh, a sound is acting. And I love the activity of sound. What it does is it gets uh, louder and quieter and it gets higher and lower, and it gets longer and shorter. It does all those things which I, I'm completely satisfied with that. I don't need sound to talk to me. We don't see much difference between time and space. We don't know where one begins and the other stops. So that uh, most of the arts we think of as being in time and most of the arts we think of as being in space. I, Marcel Duchamp, for instance, began thinking of uh, time, I mean, thinking of music as being not a time art, but a space art. And he made it a piece called Sculpture Musicale, which means <coughs> different sounds coming from different places and lasting, producing a sculpture which is sonorous and which remains. People expect listening to be more than listening. And so sometimes they speak of uh, inner listening um, or the meaning of sound. Uh, when I uh, talk about music, I just, it, it finally comes to people's minds that I'm talking about sound that doesn't mean anything. Um, that is not inner, but is just outer. And they say, they, these people who understand that finally say, you mean it's just sound? Thinking that to, for something to just be a sound, <coughs> that to be useless. Whereas I love sound just as they are. And I have no need for them to be anything more than what they are. I don't want them to be psychological. I don't want a sound to pretend that it's a bucket, or that it's a president, or that it's in love with another sound. <laughs> <laughs> I just want it to be a sound. Uh, and I'm, I'm not so stupid either. There was a, a German uh, philosopher who's very well known, Immanuel Kant. And he said there are two things that uh, don't have to mean anything. One is music, and the other is laughter. <laughs> you don't have to mean anything that is in order to give us very deep pleasure. You know that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> which I prefer to all others, is the experience of silence. And the silence, almost everywhere in the world now, is, is um, traffic. If you listen to Beethoven or to Mozart, you see that they're always the same. But if you listen to traffic, you see it's always different. It's a great passage, um, or a great little bit of interview there. Um, so I'm a human geographer. And uh, that means many different things. Um, it, for some, it means uh, um, maps. And um, uh, certainly maps are uh, a part of my business. 
But um, what I'm really concerned with is the nature of space and our relationship to space uh, in terms of uh, uh, a variety of different scales of human and social interaction. Uh, so that would mean uh, all sorts of different relationships that, that range from uh, our relationships with our personal spaces, like our, like our bedrooms and the way that we arrange our bedrooms, divide up our, our spaces inside of our homes, maybe have uh, certain expectations about whose job it is to do what inside of a home space, for example, um, uh, all the way up to and including global spaces, spaces that you know, sort of span and encompass the entire world. Um, for me, as a human geographer, what ties those together and all these different types of spaces in between, public spaces, football fields and everything else is that there are social processes that are at work in each one of those at each one of those scales that make those spaces peculiar specific and that make them perhaps do things that that don't happen at another scale um, and why that's important is 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 that Historically, the way that we've thought about the relationship between space and time is a kind of relationship between something that is one thing that is very dynamic and constantly changing, and one thing that is very stable and static. And traditionally, time has been the thing that is very dynamic and constantly changing, right? The clock is constantly ticking, tick, 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 tick. And when we think about a space, it seems to stay relatively the same all the way you know, through time seems to be unchanging. Um, and oftentimes, different thinkers have treated space simply as a container, as an empty space, right? Something that gets filled with social life. And what I'd like to suggest to you in, in uh, discussing the city uh, for a couple of minutes is that, uh, well, is the, the, the conception of, uh, that's produced by human geographers that space in and of itself is something that is dynamic. It's something that's constantly changing. And it's something that is, importantly, produced. It's produced by the way that we relate to each other. It's produced by our everyday activities. It's produced by habits, by uh, uh, different obligations and commitments, and so on and so forth. And importantly, by the patterns that emerge in our social lives over time. Uh, so an obvious you know, easy example uh, of that would be the traffic that we encounter, um, you know, somewhere between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. coming into Madison on weekdays, right? Or leaving Madison, oh, somewhere around 3.30 maybe. I don't, I don't actually leave my office until 7 or 8, but I'm assuming it starts probably at 3.30, 4, 5, 5-ish, rush hour, right? These are rhythms and patterns that occur on a daily basis that produce space in a certain, in a certain way. So whereas a street may be easily accessible, easy to move through, suddenly it becomes very slow and congested. And that relation is really important for thinking about, for thinking about the complexity of our spatial relationships. So I, I'm not going to trouble you with all these technical terms because I've been told not to use them. So <laughs> let me just say that when we talk about cities, we think about cities in, as, you know, you, by using the term urbanization. And that is, the suggestion is that the space of the city is itself a process. It's a process that involves all sorts of different types of relations. So for example, the movement of money through a city, right, that involves both actual money, it involves the transportation of commodities and food and, uh, all, and people and bodies through a space at different times during the day. And of course, the congestion of certain types of commodities and certain types of uh, economic social relations in different parts of the city. Um, it involves uh, the relationships uh, between public and private institutions, which are constantly changing and moving through that space, which do things, different types of things, for different social uh, bodies in space, and sometimes constitute and produce different types of social bodies different types of relations. Um, 
Uh, the concentration of people in a variety of different ways um, affects uh, space processually and continuously, and it's constantly changing. And um, that, of course, uh, you know, feeds into the, the, uh, the complexity of and size of a city, which has all sorts of interesting political effects you know, through the inter inter interactions of different people who wouldn't normally come together, for example. The emergence of, you know, hipsters and cool people, you know, and bring interesting trends to different spaces that you wouldn't otherwise encounter. So all of these sorts of relations are occurring on a regular basis. And, and all I'd like you to really take from that is that these aren't completely random, that they have patterns to them. And as a geographer, what I like to study is kind of the intersection between the random processes that are occurring and the patterns that begin to emerge. And that's one area in which we begin to see uh, rhythms begin to move or emerge. I'm going to kind of run you quickly through this, because um, that's a lot of text to read, and I don't want you to, to worry about it too much. What's important here is that one of these key processes that we see occurring uh, on a regular basis is the emergence of different types of uh, spatial formations that are related to cities. The emergence of suburbs, the emergence of metropolitan spaces, the emergence of downtowns, financial districts, um, which move much like a, a, a river meanders. Um, and this, these emergence of these different types of spatial formations, of course, has arguably relations on, uh, or uh, impacts on the spaces that sit you know, next to cities. So rural spaces, for example, that are impacted by the uh, movement of bodies from, the rural, from rural spaces to an urban space, uh, which happens, for example, when work is, work is hard to find um, and hard to compete with when you've got uh, big corporations that are in city spaces and uh, transportation is hard to um, get access to, to get to work in city spaces. And so you see people who live in rural spaces suddenly moving towards an urban space in order to find work. Or different shifts that, where you see people who were formerly in urban spaces moving towards the suburbs, for example. Um, these processes for, uh, for uh, human geographers are interesting um, for a number of different reasons. But just to recall uh, for a moment the, the idea that space is not simply a container, what we've sort of put in the place of that by describing space as some kind of a process is a kind of dual relation that emerges between society on the one hand and space on the other. And again, this is a bit jargon-filled, uh, this slide. But what's crucial is that society and space for geographers is a, a dialectical relation. And by dialectical, what we're suggesting is that society and space are in dialogue, which means not only is society producing different types of spaces to live in and work in and be in and, tran and move through on a regular basis, and not only are different spaces producing kind of environments for different types of work, like this space produces, this space is produced for us to come together and share ideas, uh, to think about them, and to get exposed to ideas that we may not have been exposed to before. Different workspaces are, are uh, uh, in different places to, to produce different types of commodities, and so on and so forth. It produces different types of social bodies. But rather, as a, di as a dialectic, that is, as two ideas that are in dialogue with each other, and much like a dialogue that we would be having, we would kind of build off of our ideas, society and space build off of each other. So not only do they produce each other, that is, not only do people produce spaces, and not only do spaces produce different types of social relations, but the fact that they're in relationship to each other produces further types of relations and spaces. And on and on and on it goes. And just to give you a 10-gallon word that you can uh, um, you know, share with your friends later, we call this co-production. They produce each other. And they produce each other in a kind of dynamic relation that's, that is constantly on the move. And that, by virtue of that, produces different types of patterns. This is Neil Smith, 
um, who uh, introduced the idea of uneven development uh, to geography. And Smith's suggestion was that this relationship of co-production in a city, right, where you've got spaces that are producing social formations and social bodies that are producing different spaces in a co-productive relationship, not only are we producing each other and our spaces in a continuous way, but that's done unevenly. So he's really concerned about uh, 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 relationships uh, involving property and the circulation of capital. And one thing that he's noticed is that oftentimes spaces are valued in different ways. And that that unevenness in the way that different spaces are valued allows for certain types of people, investors, for example, to accumulate more money. Right? So for example, for uh, real estate agents, uh, it's a good way to make money is to have one space that's considered to be valued and another space that's considered to be devalued that is, enables you to kind of move people who are looking for places to live over to one space that's more expensive, and so on and so forth. And so, so the unevenness is important for this socio-spatial relation. Um, and as a consequence, uh, as you might imagine, a devalued space produces populations as well. It produces devalued populations, right? It attracts certain communities and so on and so forth. So one thing that we look at um, in geography is the way that different types of communities are formed and move around a city space through the unevenness of those socio-spatial relations. And the way that that unevenness produces potentially social unevenness as well. And so this is one way that we kind of crack open spatial relations to think about questions of social justice, questions of difference and unfairness, um, and so on and so forth. The relationship between, uh, uh, what is it called, the Freedom Corporation and um, the, the communities living downriver from it in West Virginia would be a perfect example of this, of how, of how spaces are valued in different ways and how those produce different types of social relations. So that's one perspective. The other perspective that I'd like to run to, to really quickly um, is a second moment that's flagged up in the John Cage video. John Cage mentions the, the nature of sound and the relationship uh, between sound and the city. He talks about traffic. And so on the one hand, while human geographers will compare in a very analytic way the way that different spaces are, are valued or devalued and the, the impacts that that has on the communities that live there, uh, on the other hand, there's a group of people who think about mapping a city in ways that um, would otherwise be hidden from how it is that we think about our relationship to space. And so when you think about a map, what do you normally see on a map? You normally see government buildings, maybe restaurants, maybe churches, maybe museums, and so on and so forth, right? And that's constant. It's consistent in maps. Well, for a geographer, we see that as a way of representing space. And it's, it should be interesting to you that some things show up on a map and other things don't. And that happens again and again and again. And why that's interesting is that it probably doesn't capture your experience of space. And so there's a group of French thinkers, because of course, they're French, so uh, who thought of, who, who in the 1960s proposed a rhythm analysis that would approach the city by rather than thinking about a map and the different types of locations for consumption or political power on the map, rather they would follow a city through their senses. And this is called rhythm analysis. So they would allow the city and its various different flows and sensibilities to guide the body through the city. Um, and the, this process that they developed is they call psychogeography. Not ah, psychogeography, but you know, <laughs> psych, thinking about the psychology of life. Uh, um, and what this, what this suggests is that the city itself is a kind of complicated, changing, dynamic environment that not only produces us as a kind of social body or a multiplicity of different social bodies, but in our everyday interactions 
with the city as we move through it. It's pushing us and pulling us in a variety of different ways by drawing upon our sensations, our capacities to sort of not only think about the city and analyze the city, but feel the city and, and listen to the city as John Cage does and smell the city. And this produces potentially a very different sensibility when it comes to thinking about a map. So these movements through the city, the, 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 this group of thinkers call a derive or a drift. You allow your, your, your sensation of, the, of your, sens your sensual relation to space to push and pull you through that environment. Now, I, I mentioned maps at the beginning, and the reason I did this is that part of the product of this is a very different kind of way of thinking about mapping space. Now, I started out by suggesting that we oftentimes have been taught to think about space as an empty container, as a grid where stuff gets populated on it. It would be very different to think about a kind of psychogeography and the map that would come out of that. A flat space, an empty container, wouldn't quite capture that space, would it? So in its place, and this is what I'll close up on, here's one example that comes from uh, one thinker, um, Debord, um, which is an OK map. But some of the other ones that are really interesting are the mental maps like this, where people redraw the space of their experience and the way that they've been pushed and pulled through a city, um, and reimagine kind of the patterns and rhythms that that space produces. Um, I know that I'm running out of time, and that's about where I wanted to stop. As a matter of fact, I had a cartographer come in and ask me if this was a map today. Um, that's it for me. Um, so I just wanted to offer you a kind of alternative way uh, through John Cage of thinking about not necessarily the rhythms that are, that are uh, mappable, but the rhythms that are unmappable that we uh, encounter on an everyday basis. Thanks very much. Faster than I can, I'm sure. Yeah, we can. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Rick Amasino from the biochemistry department, and I'm going to talk about biological rhythms. My lab and I study the yearly rhythms of plants. Uh, for example, we study uh, the mechanisms by which plants are able to sense that it's spring and flower in the spring, as illustrated uh, by these columbines, or other rhythms, uh, for example, in the fall, we're all familiar with the rhythms of many plants' uh, leaves uh, changing color, as illustrated by this album cover of a, from Dave Brubeck that I thought would be appropriate given the connections to music. And how plants uh, do these yearly rhythms is because they're sensitive to the year yearly rhythms of our planet. In other words, plants, many plants have evolved the ability to measure changing day length, changing temperatures, and they, they measure this, they sense this, and then translate it into their own rhythms. And an example of what happens if you deprive a plant of its rhythms is that it can't do the various rhythms that it's uh, typically doing. For example, a cabbage plant needs the rhythm of temperature throughout a cycle of the plant, a seasonal cycle, to flower, uh, just like columbine does. Here's a cabbage plant that's been uh, deprived of that temperature rhythm of the planet. It's been grown in a greenhouse. And instead of going through its rhythm, it just keeps growing in, in, uh, without flowering. This particular cabbage is five years old and will simply keep growing unless it's exposed to that rhythm of the planet. So that's one type of yearly rhythm. I also wanted to mention uh, two other rhythms. One uh, that I bet most of you are familiar with or circadian rhythms. So these are the daily rhythms that organisms from microbes to plants uh, to us and other animals have. The word circadian comes from circa, which means approximately, and dian for day. So these are rhythms that 
undergo an approximate daily cycle. And I wanted to start by describing a key experiment that revealed an important feature, the characteristic feature of circadian rhythms. Experiment done many years ago in 1729, or at least published then, uh, by Jean-Jacques Dortu's de Meyron. And this, you're all familiar, I'm sure, or many of you are, with the fact that many plants have daily cycles of leaf movement or flower movement that leaves and flowers move at, in day-night cycles. Well, he did a very simple experiment. He wondered what would happen if you took a plant and put it in the dark. And the surprising result was those rhythms continued. And I have a short video to illustrate that. Uh, this is from a colleague, Roger Handgarter. This plant is velvet leaf, a common weed in the Midwest. And this is under constant conditions, yet those cycles still continue. At night, the leaves fold down and open in the day. And so that's a nice example from the plant world of a circadian or 24-hour rhythm. You might be wondering why the leaves fold up at night. One advantage of that is it can uh, mitigate water loss and also make the plant less susceptible to wind damage and other things. But the key conclusion you have to reach from that type of experiment, that these rhythms continue without day-night cycles, is there must be some sort of internal clock that's keeping time, and it can keep time even without the day-night cycles, that's controlling things like leaf movement. I wanted to give you a simple model of how these clocks work. There's been tremendous progress in biochemistry and understanding the gears and the springs, the mechanism of these clocks. But they are all based on a very simple principle that I want to illustrate here. And that is, they consist of activators and repressors. So think of an activator, for example, as something, maybe a protein, something that can cause the production of a repressor. And the repressor, in turn, causes the removal of the activator. So imagine this is one part of a circadian cycle, morning. A lot of activator, less repressor. But since we have activator, as the cycle progresses, there'll be more repressor. Of course, if there's more repressor, it will repress the activator. So over time, there'll be less activator. If there's le less activator, the levels of the repressor go away with less repressor then the activator comes on again, and the cycle continues. So these cycles are based on these types of feedback loops at a biochemical level. But that's just the clock itself. Well, how does that translate into things like leaves moving in a daily cycle? Well, that's also pretty simple too, at least in outline form. At times when there's a lot of activator, the activator can control not only the repressor, but can control other things levels of hormones, cycles of hormones, expression of genes. Or at different times of the cycle, the repressor can be influencing various things. So in a simple way, uh, these are how these biological cycles are constructed. So I've talked about plants. What about animals? Uh, one of the things I'm sure many of you know are, is under the circadian daily rhythm cycle are sleep-wake cycles. And these can be studied in organisms ranging from humans to mice. Mice are a favorite experimental organism. And here's a, a diagram of a setup from this particular source. And so, unlike many humans, when mice are awake, they like to exercise. <laughs> and, and so you can measure their exercise uh, by connecting their exercise wheel to a monitor that records that. And these are the types of um, output that you get. For example, the thin lines versus the thick lines are times of inactivity or activity or sleep-wake cycles. And what you can see is when you have the mice in a precise light-dark cycle, the light comes on at a certain time, the dark uh, light goes away at a certain time, their uh, activity cycle is very consistent over days. But then if you put them in, say, continuous light or continuous dark, just like the leaves of the plant I showed, they keep, the cycle continues, but it drifts. So it drifts to either shorter or longer uh, periods. So you can see over time the cycle drifting. Now what does this part of the experiment tell us? It tells us that these clocks are not very precise. They keep 24-hour time, but they kind of drift. And so what keeps them precise is that every day those clocks are reset by the light-dark signal. It's as if you had a clock that didn't run very well and you had to readjust it a little bit every day. But it's actually important for biological organisms that the clock does drift because the drift and the ability to be reset by light enables organisms to adjust 
the, to the different cycles that occur throughout the year. You don't want to be active at the very same time in the middle of the summer versus spring because daylight's coming at a different time. Or a practical example is if you travel to a many time zones away, such as Europe, uh, your clock, through this mechanism of drifting, is able to be reset. And it's set by light in all organisms. And in humans and other animals, that light's actually perceived in the eyes. Um, most of the light we perceive is for vision. It goes to various parts of the brain involved in vision. But there are a, a subset of cells in the eye, a very minor fraction of cells in the eye, that have a different role. They don't participate in vision. They simply send a, a signal through neurons to a region of the brain, the suprachiasmatic nuclei, to indicate whether the lights are on or off. And this is the master regulator of our rhythms, which then communicates with other parts of the brain with various outputs to control hormone levels and other rhythmic things. An example of this, these are just some of the many things that are under control of our circadian rhythms. Look in the mid to late afternoon. Best coordination, fastest reaction time, greatest cardiovascular efficiency and muscle strength. The things that predict good athletic performance. And there are many consequences of this, but one is that it turns out a study showed that baseball teams that had the greater circadian advantage were more successful. In other words, they won more. Uh, imagine a West Coast team traveling to play an East Coast team after dinner. Well, the East Coast team has missed their circadian peak for athletic performance, but the West Coast team, due to the time change, is right closer or at their circadian peak. And the West Coast teams, in fact, uh, statistically, it's been shown, do have an advantage under those circumstances. Um, but the, one of the most important biological uh, aspects of circadian rhythms are the ability for, of organisms to anticipate. Here's just one example. Uh, there's, your, there's a sharp rise in blood pressure based on your circadian rhythm before you wake up. In other words, the circadian rhythm is uh, getting you ready to be ready to go when you wake up. Here's an example from the plant world that's sort of similar. We already uh, looked at one uh, film of leaf movement. Here's another. This is a sunflower plant. You can see it's during the day. You can see the shadows moving. Of course, this is time lapse, so everything's moving faster. And as towards the end of the day, the leaves are anticipating. I missed stopping it quickly enough, but the leaves were um, folding down even before it was night. They're anticipating night. And then, if I continue this, this is night now. You can see uh, that even during the night, they're starting to anticipate day. You can see the leaves now opening up even before dawn, so that by the time dawn arrives, in just a moment, there it is, the leaves are already up. So anticipation provides a real advantage. Another example of uh, just one of the many things under circadian control in humans and other animals is the production of growth hormone. So there's a very sharp peak of growth hormone production in the first part of the sleep cycle. You can see this strong peak just in the first part of the night. There's something similar uh, going on in plants, and that is growth of something like a fruit during the night. So here's another time-lapse video, and I want you to focus on this pumpkin. And you can tell when it's day. Again, you'll see the shadows moving in the time-lapse video. Whereas at night, there's constant light, uh, which is illuminating this plant to, to make a good video. Whoops. So let me start that up. So here, it's night. You see the pumpkin enlarging. But in the day, not much is happening. Night, enlarging again. Day, not much happening, and so on. And I'll let it run another few cycles. <coughs> OK, that's the last one. The significance of this cycle is that during the day, the plant is focused, so to speak, on leaves undergoing a process called photosynthesis to accumulate sugar. And during the night is when they take the time to move all that sugar from the leaves to the fruits. So that's why the fruits are expanding at night. Again, it optimizes growth to be able to have these rhythms and to be able to sequester when you do things. So I want to end by talking about one other type of biological rhythm. It's a 17-year rhythm. 
And as some of you may have guessed, it occurs in a group of insects, certain types of cicadas. So it, it can't match the um, impressiveness of the 500 million year rhythm that Ellen talked about. <laughs> but as far as biological rhythms go, I think this is a really remarkable one. To think that, that an organism has evolved the ability to undergo a rhythm of this length is, is really astounding. And I wanted to show just a few short videos uh, about the rhythm, and then if there's time, just mention why this rhythm may have evolved. So um, I want to begin. These, these, uh, so the cicadas spend 17 years, or most of 17 years of their life cycle, underground feeding on plant roots. And then certain types of them emerge in a synchronous way every 17 years. So here's a bit of uh, video of that emergence. You see a few coming out of the ground, but what's most impressive is if you're in an area where this occurs, this film was made in southern Indiana. There are just enormous numbers of these, all in synchrony in this 17-year rhythm. And they emerge from the ground, and then um, find a place like a tree to crawl up and attach to. So once they're attached, then there's another part of this cycle. And that is they undergo a change to the adult form. And I'm going to add the music to this, because I like it, that came with the uh, uh, producer of this particular video. It, it's not mine. I borrowed it from a colleague, uh, Roger Handgarter at Indiana University. So you can watch the change to adulthood. So they quickly convert to the adult form. And then there's only one thing left to do. They emerge uh, above ground for only one purpose, and of course that's to reproduce, to lay their eggs, and let that rhythm continue. So here's just a short clip from uh, this video uh, showing the completion of this rhythm. So it'll be uh, a mating. Uh, a deposition of eggs. And then, after a very short time, there's an enormous number of, of uh, dead cicadas in these regions. But what they leave behind are, of course, a lot of eggs. And the next generation emerges. And uh, its goal is to get out of the trees where the eggs were laid and go back underground for another 17 years. So they'll simply fall out of the trees and um, dig into the earth, feed on roots for 17 years, and then this really remarkable 17-year rhythm will uh, continue. Now, I wanted to end by saying what might have been a driving force for the evolution of this type of rhythm. We talked about circadian rhythms and the uh, importance of anticipation. Here, and I should say, uh, whereas it, for circadian rhythms, we understand biochemically to a large extent how they work. We have no idea biochemically how this 17-year rhythm is accomplished by cicadas. But we do have an idea of what, of what its purpose is, and that's uh, to avoid predation. So cicadas um, are a great food for a lot of uh, animals. And although they look, they're rather large and they look rather menacing, they're actually pretty defenseless. They don't bite, they don't sting, and they're actually pretty clumsy when they fly. So they're, a very, they're really an easy lunch for any predators, whether it's squirrels or birds. So in fact, if they emerged every year, predators would adjust to them and probably decimate them because they are so defenseless. So one way to avoid predators who um, is to emerge every 17 years, because then the predators can't come to rely on them as a food source. And when they come out in such numbers in this 17-year rhythm, although there's plenty of them being eaten, most of them, simply by sheer numbers, avoid predation. So in a sense, uh, the predators 
have actually been incredible cicada breeders because they've bred cicadas over evolutionary time to have this remarkable rhythm to avoid them. So I'll stop there. Give me just one minute here to get my other fun things loaded up here. Oh, that's not mine. That looks familiar. Okay, great. All right, I think we got that down. We'll see if the movies work. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, uh, about heart rhythms or cardiac rhythms. Um, and my name is Lee Eckhart. I am uh, uh, going to be talking about the small areas of the, of the, from the universe now to into the parts of our body. And as things go from grandiose universe to our bodies, it also becomes a lot faster too. So um, uh, as you'll see as I go through my talk, I'm one of the uh, faculty in cardiology and I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist, which means I study the rhythms of the heart for living. That's both clinical arrhythmias, but I study the cellular mechanisms of abnormal rhythms of the heart. In my basic science lab, I'm one of the investigators in the um, cellular and molecular arrhythmia research program. And then I'm also very interested in genetic arrhythmias uh, and co-direct the inherited arrhythmia program here. So I get to talk to you today about my favorite topic, which is the heart, uh, and specifically heart rhythms. Um, it is the most amazing part of your body, I think. Um, without it, none of you would be sitting here. Um, and the heart, the heart rhythm is, uh, uh, is different type of uh, rhythm and different type of music in a way that uh, then maybe you've uh, thought about this in, in this fashion. And that it's the rhythm of the heart is entirely driven by electricity. So electrical waves come across the heart and drive the pump. So the heart is simply a electrically driven pump. And it does this for you while you're sitting here listening about 60 to 80 times a minute. That gives you 100,000 beats in a given day, 35 million a, in a year, and in a normal lifespan, that's three billion heartbeats. And it happens without you even thinking about it or doing anything to achieve that. If problems happen, though, with your heart rhythm, for a few seconds, you might lose consciousness. And for several minutes, you can end up having end organ damage and then even dying. So I think the importance of the heart and its rhythm is, can't be disputed. Um, but today I'm going to talk about this in maybe a little bit more easy to digest and not so uh, doom and gloom uh, uh, um, manner. And, and that is the analogy of the heart's electrical system to music. And it may have not have ever thought about the heart rhythm and, uh, as uh, analogous to music, but um, um, because of this talk, and I, I uh, have uh, decided to put this together in this fashion. But the electrical system in your heart really is 
um, it sets the heart rhythm, um, uh, which, which drives this pump. And the concept of this being musical um, is quite possible you've never thought of this before, because when we think of music, you know, this is what we think of. We think of this, you know, uh, this is a picture from 1930s, Robert Hoffman's getting ready to play a you know, uh, magnificent piano concerto to an audience full of elegantly dressed people. And, you know, there's, we've had uh, centuries of people enjoying music in this fashion. At the same time that this is going on, the heart rhythm had not been necessarily recorded, um, had not been recorded. And the labs of people looking at the heart rhythms were a lot less elegant, I'll say. So this is the first recording of the EKG done by William Eindhoven in 1901. And the contrast between you know, music hall and the, uh, the guy sitting on a stool with his hands and feet in buckets of salt water can't be more apparent. But you know, he did end up getting the Nobel Prize for this in 1924. And I think anyone who spends much of their career with uh, themselves you know, hooked up to some uh, uh, garage uh, arranged equipment with their hands and feet in salt buckets at least deserves a shot at the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so that was the first heart recording of the heart rhythm. Um, but we use a lot of the same terms in when we talk about heart rhythms as you do in music. At the organ level we talk about the frequency or the rhythm, um, the various cells that uh, create the waves of electricity that allow for the rhythm to generate. You talk about those, um, describing them as with respect to their duration, velocity, the pitch, the rise of those uh, various action potentials. And then even, even more so um, uh, in analogous to a musical composition is the subcellular organization of those uh, of those various uh, um, uh, within the heart, uh, so that uh, each area of the heart has a very specialized job. Um, and just like if you're going to write a string quartet, you don't have a symphony orchestra play that. There's specialized cells of the heart that are, have specific jobs to do as well. So we'll talk about that. In um, this is a drawing by my favorite medical artist, Frank Netter, um, and showing the. Do I have that pointer? That's fine. I'll use my mouse. Someone walked off with the pointer. Oh, no, it's me. I got it. <laughs> um, my favorite medical artist, his name is uh, Frank Netter. And this is a, a, just a drawing of the heart that shows all of the various regions that are involved with the electrical conduction uh, um, that sets your heart rhythm. And you may or may not know this, but this up in the top uh, here, you have your own body's metronome. And this sets the rhythm of your heart. And it beats with regular frequency if you're sitting. If you're like me and you're up in front of all these people that are staring at you, might be going a little bit faster than that. And then those signals then are sent from the top chamber of the um, right, uh, the top chamber of the right side of the heart then to the two atria, through, not through the muscle tissue, it's through these fast electrical conducting fibers, and then that goes to the bottom chambers of the heart. And when I talk about speed in contrast to Ellen's talk, um, the speed with which that, that electrical conduction has to occur to the bottom chambers of the heart and then excite the bottom chambers of the heart, the ventricles, um, needs to occur within about 80 milliseconds. And the entire process of the first initiation of that beat to the end of it usually occurs in about 400 milliseconds. So what are these squiggly lines over here on this side? Those are the different jobs of the different parts of the heart. And each one of those uh, lines represents an action potential or the excitation of that particular, uh, that particular area of the heart. And those action potentials um, then the summation of those action potentials come together, and this is what you record from the outside of the body as the body's EKG. And each of those different action potentials then are derived by specialized channels. And I won't talk too much about um, the structure function, but this is where I spend my life. Okay, so you talk about going from big to small. I study these various channels uh, within the heart. 
But these, if you will humor my analogy here, um, these channels are like the instruments in an orchestra. And so the channels then, depending on the density, the number of that you have, um, and their specific, uh, this, their specific action, then that is what sets the shape, duration, um, and recovery for each part of the heart. So this shape of the action potential for d different parts of the heart is shaped entirely by these different currents that are um, passed by these channels. And to maybe make that analogy a little bit easier to digest, I have a short movie, not that one. over there laughing at me. <laughs> OK, there we go. So the action potential you can see over here. These are the various channels opening and closing. And that's electrical current flowing in and out of your heart. It happened so fast I couldn't even explain it uh, before, before the video ended. So I'm just going to rewind that real quick. Only lasts for a couple seconds. Here we go. So the initiation of that impulse starts with those that first channel opening. And then there's this little plateau phase where those other channels are letting ions pass through. And then the heart recovers um, with, uh, uh, with those red channels there. So that is, the electri that is how the electrical current is then passed through the heart. That's how that um, action potential is generated. And this, again, the shape of that varies in different parts of the, different parts of the heart. So again, with the orchestra model, that um, all of the various instruments or the various components of the heart are generate is um, made up of these ion channels, and each of these ion channels are then highly regulated into for certain re regions of the heart. So, for example, if you're going to put an orchestra together, you're not necessarily going to put violas and basses all together in one uh, section. You're going to put them in very organized areas, and so that's exactly what happens in the heart. You organize the channels in, um, in certain regions and so that you can have um, a coordinated effort of all of those channels together. And then that's how you end up with a coordinated heartbeat. If any of those systems break down, then that is when you have what we call an arrhythmia. So your heart is going out of rhythm. If there's a problem with the channels, there's not enough, there's death of the tissue, um, then that whole system breaks down and, and you have an arrhythmia. And this is what I spend my, uh, my clinical life and what I've dedicated my research to is trying to discover those mechanisms of fast and slow heart rhythms. So for example, if you unfortunately sustain a, a heart attack and you have abnormal blood flow to your heart, there can be death in this tissue here. And then that sets up abnormal electrical flow through the heart there, and that can predispose you to something called ventricular tachycardia. And we take these people into our uh, EP lab, and we can study that particular rhythm of the heart, um, figure out where it's coming from, and then treat that with something called radio frequency energy. We use very uh, um, high frequency radio waves, um, and then that destroys the tissue. Um, and then stops that abnormal rhythm from occurring. So each heartbeat is a highly organized um, and coordinated event, which is generated by specialized conduction uh, tissue. The instruments of the heart are these ion currents and the um, uh, carried by ion in the currents, the electrical currents are carried by these ion channels. And it is really the orchestration of all of those ionic currents that allows for a coordinated heartbeat. And this occurs in all of you, 
seamlessly, continuously, absolutely precisely, uh, and without any effort on your own part. Thanks for your attention. So the whole universe is filled with all of this rhythmic activity that we may or may not have been aware of. I certainly did not know like 100% of what I just learned. So <laughs> it's really fun to see what's kind of pulsating out there. And the answer is everything is. Everything is. But what about the rhythms that we create ourselves? Because we seem to have a need to make rhythm. So I want to tell you a little bit about how musicians make rhythm, how we think about rhythm, and how we divide up our palette that we work on is a palette of time rather than a palette of space like in the city, large space, or channels in the heart. We deal with the unfolding of time, and how we divide up that time is how we conceive of rhythm. I want to start out by having you listen to this. So there's a chunk of time with not much in it. In fact, John Cage, who we saw in our geography talk, very much liked listening to non-musical things that were happening in the world. In the case of that example, there was a little bit of creaking, and then you all got very quiet, and you listened, and almost nothing could be heard. In music, when there is no sound, we call that a rest. I actually find that when there's a silence like that, it's often not particularly restful. It can be very tense. And I wonder if the rhythm that musicians create is actually somehow relaxing to us. It may be because the world is so full of rhythms and by creating even rhythms, we begin to feel somehow integrated. And when there's nothing, we feel very alienated. We can. Other times we can enjoy silence as a respite from rhythm and all, almost as if periods of silence become our rhythm. So let's talk about, and I've got our musicians up here to help me out. They have no idea what's going to happen and neither do I, but um, let's talk about how we think about rhythm. So we have that period of silence. So how do musicians divvy it up? So I could divvy it up like this. I'm making a regular beat. Um, and that beat, if it has any regularity, starts you start anticipating it, you expect it, you have a feeling of satisfaction when it comes. We can do the same thing on the piano. I can ask Johannes to just play a slow series of the same C major chord. Thank you. And so we have, yes, we have a chord, we have harmony, but we have the when of that chord, and the when is crucial to music. Now, we can further divide those periods of time into smaller periods. So we can, Johannes can do the same thing, and we'll do it in a period of time that lasts four beats, and it'll go like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Four, okay? And we could also do it in a period of time that has three beats. It would sound like this. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three, and so on. The music that we play, at least in the Western world, is what is called metrical. And what metrical music means is there's a meter, which means there's a given number of beats and then we start over. So our music is cyclical. And what kind of music is typically in three? Call it out. 
a waltz, exactly. And in fact, we have body motions that work along with that time so that we take a big step on the first beat if we're dancing a waltz and then two little steps and then a big step and two little steps. One, you got a waltz handy? So one, two, three. 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 So that our body, thank you, that's lovely. <laughs> so that our body is acting out the rhythm that we feel. Now you may sit there and you don't think, oh, there's three beats, it must be a waltz. But in fact, almost all waltzes are in three. There's actually a really famous example of a waltz that's in five. Anybody know this one? Tchaikovsky, yeah. Tchaikovsky, yep, in the Sixth Symphony, wrote a waltz that's in five beats, and it really sounds like a waltz. And if you've heard the Sixth Symphony by Tchaikovsky, and you've heard that particular movement of it, you've probably thought, oh, what a great waltz, and you may never have noticed, wait, this is not, it doesn't have the right number of beats, but he's very cleverly able to make it feel like it's in three when it isn't, and that's kind of a trick that composers enjoy playing. So, I can divide my big beat into smaller beats. So why don't you, can you just give me just click, two, three, four, click, two, three, four, click, two. So there's regular time. Now, Keith can divide that in half. He can divide it in half again. Eventually, he's going to need the other stick. He can divide it in half again. He can divide it in half again. Probably you can go at least one more. One more, maybe. No. <laughs> so we, in our notation, in our musical notation, have a way of showing when we get half the number or twice the number of beats filling a given time and then twice again. And if you think of musical notation that has a note head and a thing going up, which is called a stem, and then the beams going across, and each extra beam that's stacked makes the thing go twice as fast, right? And you can get exactly what we had here. Of course, we can divide in other ways as well. So if you get some eighth notes going, slow eighth notes, chunk, 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 go to them slower. Actually, let's make quarter notes. Now, instead, let's go even a little slower. I want to see if you guys can do this. Can you guys divide this into halves? Go. Right. Now, thank you. One question that I, that I have that has not been answered today, because unfortunately we don't have all week to do sound waves. We've got to do it in a little time period. Why can we do that? I have, I don't know the answer, but just about everybody can do that. Why? I can't even think of the type of scientist that we would have. We'd need 17 scientists, you know, psychologists and anthropologists and God knows what to tell us. Why are we so good at this? But with this appears to be a skill that we all have. Let's try getting those quarter notes going again. Can you divide this into three instead of two? Yeah, good. So, you can do it, right? And in fact, there's all kinds of ways that we can divide up these beats, which is why the title of my little lecture here, which is almost drawing to a close because I want to hear some music, is Subdivide and Conquer. Because in fact, what we do with time is we take the period of time from the beginning of our piece of music to the end, which could be 30 seconds and could be an hour and a half. There's a string quartet that lasts six hours. Um, and one of the things that can be hard about listening to music is that because it unfolds in time, we got to sit there and listen in time, and it can be long. And if we don't follow the thread of what the composer is trying to talk to us about, we can get fidgety and we can get bored. Other times when we are so involved, it just seems like this chopping up of time is perfect and makes us just relax uh, and enjoy what we're hearing. Some more complicated divisions of this time. If you get these quarter notes going for me. 
So we did threes. If I let, I can't talk and clap at the same time. If I get rid of every other one of those threes, Thank you. So then we get a three against a two. We get conflict. And conflict is part of any good story, right? There is, I could tell you a story that said there was once a man and he lived a very happy life and he took a nap on the grass, the end. <laughs> That's not an interesting story because there's no conflict. And music often has things fighting against other things. And there can be more complicated and conflicting subdivisions, if you could get this going again. This is a harder one. Here we go. I'm trying to do five across those two, which is they fight and we're kind of having trouble lining up because I'm not that good at that. <laughs> and you could have seven against three. You can get very complicated rhythms. Now, when I do the three against two, so you have the two, and I go. You can kind of feel that. You can feel that thing bopping a little bit. When I do seven against three, which we're not going to demonstrate for you here today because it requires special uh, padding, which we didn't bring, <laughs> all of a sudden, you hear chaos. Now, is that to say that chaos is bad in music? It is not. But it is to say that when, when we see chaos on the streets, we don't like it. It makes us uncomfortable. Because our world is an ordered place, as we've learned from all these brilliant people. And when we hear chaos, it can make us uncomfortable. I would recommend when you're listening to music that starts sounding chaotic, which I don't think is going to happen tonight, that you label that. This is music whose rhythm feels uncomfortable. I'm supposed to feel uncomfortable right now. I find that by putting a label like that, that this is tense music. We do it very well in a horror movie where the music is supposed to make us uncomfortable. Don't go in there. Don't go in that house. Right? We pay 12 bucks to have that feeling. <laughs> the same thing can happen with music without the visuals, and it's a very important part of music. Now, not only can we have metricality, which means there's a first beat, a strong beat, and then the rest of the beats until we get to the next first beat, and not only can we divide up the beats, those are all things that a metronome can do and a com computer can do, and it can be very precise and very inhuman. So if I can ask you to play a very wooden kind of a little simple groove with not any feeling at all, it's hard for him because he's so good. Let's see if you can just get something kind of ricky ticky. It's like if you were imagining a dance, thank you. If you're imagining a dance, it would be like a skeleton figure that was doing that dance. And you can flavor this now to make it come alive and not be so ricky-ticky, right? Just give it a little something to make it. Thank you. I'm going to give a word. I don't think, I told you couldn't use jargon. I don't think this counts as jargon. Let's call that the groove. What is groove? Groove is not the same as rhythm. Groove is that element of rhythm that makes it sound like it breathes and is alive. And when you're listening to music, whether it's jazz or rock and roll or classical music of any kind, when you're focusing on the rhythm, see if you can feel it breathe. How is the, f what is the time? Is it in three? Is it in four? Is it in seven? Is it something odd? And then is there a feeling of breath to it? And actually drummers have over the last hundred years developed this huge collection of different kinds of beats. Uh, that feel a certain way, like a shuffle. Shuffle. So notice that now we don't have regular subdivisions within the beat. We have chunk a chunk a chunk a chunk a chunk a chunk. What's that called? Syncopation. Syncopation. Anybody else? 
swing, that's swing, and that's what jazz players do is they swing. So if you get something that swings going, can you get going something that swings? And can you add something on top of that that swings? Great, thank you. It's just amazing that they just like, there's an on button and they go. <laughs> How many beats were they playing in the, well, how many beats to the unit of the measure? Anybody notice? Four, yeah, it was in four, right? We could do a same, can you do something in three that kind of swings? And one, two, three, and one, two. Great, thank you. Now, Johannes was, because he's kind of a fancy guy, was throwing a little, a nice little thing in there because he was actually started dividing those three beats into two beats. Can you do that? You probably can't even remember what you did. Just get our three going. Two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Dun, bong, dun, gong, gong. you suddenly start seeing that there's not just like the right side of the heart doing one thing, there's the left side doing something a little bit different. We have two things going on at once, right? Which is called the hemiola. That's our last jargon word. That's a hemiola, three against two. Um, let's do something that's a little bit more straight, like so, a little bit march-like. Can you make something up on top of that? Uh, now I'll just point out this do this isn't, doesn't have a swing. It's chunka 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 chunka. How does swing go? Chun cha chun ka chun ka chun. This thing is straight, but it's still somehow very human and alive. And this is what musicians are trying to do. We're not just taking a length of time and calling it an inch and saying now we can make a half inch. We're saying this is what this half inch feels like, right? And this is what this quarter inch feels like. So as we listen to this performance, let's pay special attention to not just the rhythm, but the way it feels, the way it makes us feel, how they play with the rhythm, if they sometimes sit back and don't rush through. Let's have a little demonstration of that. So get something regular going and kind of sit back on it a little bit, any kind of rhythm you want. Listen to the patience of the piano. Now Johannes is going to start anticipating getting ahead. Now he'll sit back. Thanks, thank you, gentlemen. It's almost like there's different color filters going on and changing the light. It feels some, sometimes like it makes you sit back, sometimes it makes you sit forward. That's what's going on in music. And that's in particular, I think, what's going on with the feel of the rhythm in jazz. So I'd like to turn this over now to the musicians. They have three pieces. I think Johannes has a few words to say about them. Thanks so much for coming. Please check out our Facebook page and like us and <laughs> There is some uh, coffee and dessert afterwards, so stick around. I think it's going to be out there. I don't know if the bar will still be set up, but have some dessert. Um, you notice there's no question and answer period at Soundwaves because we would be here for months. We'd never get past the first lecture. So, um, but the scientists and musicians have graciously agreed that they'll stick around a little bit afterwards to answer your questions. They're all very nice and nobody bites that I've seen yet. So please come up and talk to us and ask us things. And thank you so much, Johannes and gentlemen. Thank you. Um, so since the focus here is on rhythm, um, pick some material that in particular will feature our drummer. Um, you're going to hear drum solos in all three three pieces. 
Um, this first piece is a composition of mine, and it is, uh, since we're talking about meter, it is in uh, four. It does not have a swing rhythm. We'll do, we, you know, since we play jazz, um, the other two pieces will have a swing rhythm, but not, um, not all jazz pieces do. Um, this one is just in a, in a four meter, um, but now that we've talked about meter, um, you might notice that as we get to right to the end of the tune, and um, you might recognize that it's the end because a melody that we play at the beginning will come back again at the end to sort of bring things, uh, make things full circle. As we get to the end of the tune, suddenly there's, they're going to sneak in some measures that don't have four beats in them. Um, so every once in a while, a, me uh, a beat will go missing, essentially, and we'll just carry on as if that hadn't happened. Um, <laughs> So this is a, is a piece of mine entitled Water Music for People Without Aquariums. <laughs>
Um, so there's no right or wrong way to listen to music. Hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully you enjoy it. Um, if not, thank you for bearing with us. Um, but um, it, so if, if this is your first time uh, at a jazz concert and you feel uncomfortable clapping in the middle of the music, that's OK. You don't have to. Um, if, on the other hand, you're getting annoyed with the people who do, that's OK, too. It's kind of a, um, it's an acknowledgment of the fact that much of what we're playing is actually uh, improvised. Um, uh, roughly speaking, we're, um, we know the story that we're going to tell. We don't quite know yet how we're going to tell it. And that's going to be a little bit different each time. Um, so. Um, you know, it's, it's another version of um, public speaking, which I know we all enjoy and doesn't make any of us nervous. And it's kind of a pu version of public speaking with, uh, without a script, but some sort of rough set of notes. Um, so um, yeah, notice we never turned a page of music here, because um, our notes are pretty compact on, on what's going to happen. There's a melody, um, a description of the, the harmony, and of course, you know, a sense of uh, groove, of um, the groove that all of this is going to fit into. Um, so we're going we're to um, play something with a different groove. We're going to visit the, uh, the waltz thing. This will be a somewhat abstract version of a waltz. Um, I didn't compose it with the intent that people would be dancing to it, but um, I, I suppose they probably can. Uh, be nice. Um, and, uh, and I was looking for um, something else that would kind of focus on rhythm and that would feature um, Keith Leonard on, on drums in a somewhat different environment. Um, so. This piece has, at, um, a, on the first piece, you heard a drum solo at the beginning of the piece. Um, and I think sometimes drummers get a little bit annoyed because um, they spend all of their time accompanying uh, the rest of us. And then it comes time for a drum solo, and we kind of go like, go for it. You know? And the uh, rest of us, we can kind of check our tuning a little bit uh, quietly. Maybe, uh, maybe run over to the bar, get, you know, get a drink while the drum solo is going on. And, um, so, so, I, if I, yeah, I, so I think oftentimes drummers actually like it when the rest of us are in some kind of accompanying role as well. So I thought, you know, what, what might be a nice accompaniment for a drum solo? And I didn't want to make it too easy. Um, so, um, so I wrote this little bass line and uh, chord progression to go, f go with a drum solo. That, you know, if you're in three, one, two, three, one, two, three. <laughs> You know, which uh, gives the drummer quite a bit of um, material to sort of work off and uh, maybe to kind of dodge out of the way and uh, you know, capture some of it and ignore something else. So now that you know this, um, this is going to happen at the end. You'll actually um, hear that bass line uh, occur earlier on in the piece in a number of different ways. And, um, and then by the time we get to the end, they'll turn into a drum solo. This piece is entitled The Summit. Mm -hmm.
Keith Leonard on the drums and John Christensen on the bass. We have one more piece uh, we're going to play for you. Uh, when, when Dan, and thank you so much for, uh, for inviting us and putting this together. What, what a terrific, terrific program. When, when Dan invited, um, invited us to be part of this and told us about the, um, the, um, the theme and the, the um, title for tonight, uh, I Got Rhythm, I thought, well, there's a very famous piece by uh, George and Ira Gershwin called I Got Rhythm. Wouldn't it be great to play that? And I thought, no, that's too obvious. <laughs> so, so we're not going to play that for you. Um, but um, but that, that piece of music actually uh, spawned uh, an incredible number of other um, compositions. Um, there's a jazz tradition, um, and it's not just limited to jazz, but it's um, uh, jazz musicians in particular have uh, taken advantage of that, of taking a, a chord progression, a harmonic progression, um, sort of a yeah, um, cycle of things. And, but, and there's a certain rhythm to, um, uh, to the chords, too, um, a harmonic rhythm, we call it, uh, where maybe um, after 32 measures of four beats, um, you'll hear the same harmonic progression. A again, that's also part of why our music is limited to uh, just a page or two, um, because we go back to the top. Um, and um, yeah, to, to so there's a tradition of taking a, um, a, a harmonic progression and writing a new melody uh, to, to that. Um, uh, probably the best known example of that is everybody here has heard of the blues, or 12 bar blues. And, um, and it's more or less the same harmonic progression for every single 12 bar blues, but they each have a new melody and if, um, to the degree that their songs have a new set of lyrics and so on. So after the blues, probably the, uh, the second um, most common chord progression for which people have written new, um, new melodies, and the jargon for that is a, a contrafact. Um, I just learned that term myself. Um, and um, it is, uh, it's a chord progression for, for I Got Rhythm, and jazz musicians call that chord progression rhythm changes. Um, so we thought we'd play a, um, oh, some, uh, some rhythm changes pieces. Um. <laughs> is the original I got rhythm. Um, but you'll recognize <laughs> Yeah. And uh, and rubber ducky in Sesame Street and uh, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So we thought we um, we play a piece by by one of the great composers in jazz who really has a very um, interesting uh, rhythmic language as a composer and as a performer. Um, himself a very unique rhythmic language, um, Great Thelonious Monk, and this is a piece of his uh, based on I Got Rhythm called Rhythmening.